very much to the, um, to the Atlantic Treaty Association and for the other hosts for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here today um, and on a great panel that is very diverse and is covered a very wide spectrum of issues. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm the last speaker, uh, so there are a few things that I would have said that I'm no longer going to say. <laughs> my, my cherries have been picked from the UN report on foreign fighters, but nevertheless, I will continue. Um, I thought I'd give you one or two personal views and a bit of NATO flavor, the NATO approach to, to counter-terrorism. Um, I'm just going to take issue with Mr. Ben Nordman to start with, in that he specified that the military was the solution. Uh, for me, that's not the case. Um, I just wanted to make a contrast between uh, President Obama, who said in 2013 that military alone cannot keep us safe, and in the newish UN Security Council resolution on foreign terrorist fighters for Daesh and al-Nusra, where it specifically says in a very un-UN sort of way that there is a role for the military in countering foreign terrorist fighters. So I think that military is part of the solution, but it's not the solution. It's a largely civilian issue, countering terrorism. Um, it takes the whole of a government to counter terrorism because there are so many different aspects to it. Um, and likewise, I would really say it would take the whole of society to counter terrorism. You've heard many comments already um, about that issue. Uh, and likewise, it takes all the international organizations. Right at the beginning, uh, we had pointed out to us the need for EU-NATO cooperation. But it's more a question of using all the international uh, instruments uh, as tools when they fit the, the niche. Uh, when a spanner-shaped one fits a spanner-shaped hole and a hammer-shaped one fits a hammer-shaped hole. It's really a question of using them for their strengths. Um, NATO, as a political military organization, has meetings within it of heads of state and government, yes, but also ministers of defense and ministers of foreign affairs. So the aspects of counterterrorism that NATO can justifiably have a, a, a foothold in are those that relate to Ministry of Defense issues and Ministry of Foreign Affairs issues. Uh, also at the beginning, we were told that most of, our, most of our policies are old. Mine's not old. Mine only dates from 2012. Uh, and I think that that's really quite a powerful thing because it means that in a completely different environment to 9-11, which was not a turning point for terrorism, but it certainly pushed a lot of organizations to reconsider what they were doing. Uh, so in a, in a 10 years away from that, we have the Allies' views of what they think NATO should be doing on counterterrorism. Uh, and that is very potent. Um, the policy points NATO to use its strengths in three different areas. One is awareness, being aware of the threat from terrorism and how it's evolving and the areas that NATO should be looking at. And so this is the this kind of um, the intelligence and the information sharing. It's using analysts. It's reaching back for the expertise that sit in each of the countries. Uh, also, we need to have the capabilities, be they military or other, uh, to enable NATO to continue to do what it needs to do, despite the threat of terrorism. Uh, this is uh, not always a military issue. Um, it could be um, planning how to clear a route, because having a route that's free of bombs and IEDs is as appropriate to, um, uh, to moving out of Afghanistan as it is to a World Health Organization convoy going somewhere. And the third area on which we focus is engagement. And today, for me, this is engagement. This is talking to uh, others, to partners, to international organizations, to ensure that as much of the world as possible sees the threat the same way and wants to deal with it in the same way. Uh, we were talking earlier, the panel were talking earlier about the, in fact, was it Peter who said the, the counter-violent extremism in industry? Well, allies have been quite strict so far about NATO not getting on the counter-violent extremism bandwagon. Because, as I said, we have ministers of defense and ministers of foreign affairs. And 
the violent extremism takes place in countries. And it's largely a domestic, national, civilian issue. It may not even be a government issue, a lot of it, but it's certainly not a military issue unless, and there is a very distinct exception, when there is a NATO military uh, presence on the ground in a third country, the behavior of that military uh, presence can cause extremism, that can push the next wave of recruits that would, would want to reject the values of that occupying presence. So I think there, NATO has a specific counter-violent extremism possibility, but it's really just a very narrow niche. Um, one of the important things, I, I took you through the three pillars, the last one, engagement, uh, you know that NATO has uh, its partnership frameworks and the Mediterranean dialogue, the North, uh, the North Africa uh, chain of countries down as far as Mauritania, but we don't go into the Sahel, and the um, Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council um, countries, those are the areas that uh, we would be interested in talking to more to know how the problem that NATO sees on its southern flank is viewed by those that are in the midst of it. Um, this is a very key thing because we don't want to duplicate what's going on, but we need to be aware so that if and when NATO is given a mandate to do something, we can act in an informed manner. Uh, at the moment, the reaction to ISIL is the anti-ISIL coalition, which, as you know, is being led by the US. And all the NATO nations and most of the NATO partners are part of that coalition. And NATO as an organization supports it, but it isn't part of it. We don't, we're not bombing in Iraq or in Syria. We don't have any military uh, involvement in that coalition. However, we do support the functioning of the coalition because... The countries involved in it have had links to NATO and have worked with NATO and exercised with NATO and operated with NATO for decades. And the, the standardization agreements and the exercises and the interoperability discussions that they've had are what makes the coalition a possibility. It means that the countries are talking the same language, not necessarily the same uh, actual language, but the same terminology so that they can work together. Um, Peter, I think, mentioned some of the UN aspects, um, and I would just like to stress that the UN, as um, His Excellency said, the UN has had a series of um, instruments that looked at different aspects of terrorism, but then in 2006 it managed to put together the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, and that has got jobs for everybody in it. And all of us, I think, have a part to play within that. Um, and the part that we can play is dictated by our areas of strength. So I wouldn't suggest NATO was the prime mover uh, in the issue of countering violent extremism or even in the field of, of foreign terrorist fighters at the moment. But were NATO to end up on the ground in Iraq, Libya, Syria, and find its own nationals fighting it, I think you might find that there would be considerable interest in using NATO to do something about the foreign terrorist fighter issue. Um, I don't want to speak for very long, but I just wanted to finish on the bit that I find absolutely key, and this is going back to uh, the speaker before me, um, what the fundamental problem is. Uh, and it is very striking that it seems to be... Uh, if we look at it from, from the part of one of our countries, the issue for us is why are our nationals deciding to go off and fight for a cause that distance, is distant geographically and it's distant intellectually almost too. Uh, and this is the, the issue for me of education and uh, ability to promote critical thinking because I saw this like a... I was thinking this in the taxi on the way here. I do apologize for being late. Uh, the traffic was very bad. But ISIL is like a sort of instant sugar rush. It hasn't got any, it hasn't got much in the way of complexity that goes with it. 
you turn up and fight, and it's violent, and it's, and it's a, like a buzz, a quick fix. fix. Uh, whereas Al-Qaeda was, uh, in a way, the sort of, um, what's the word, high glycemic index, the sort of uh, porridge version of, of terrorism. You have to think about it, and the, there is uh, some intellectual background that goes with it, with the theological uh, interpretations. So it's very interesting to me to see how our nationals have, have got to the stage where, in a very short time for many of them, young people who, whose interests are no longer the things that decades, that generations of people have fought for as what they want to achieve in life, choose to go off and fight. So I'm going to stop, because this is not an area I have any uh, right to pontificate, but it's just interesting to me why we are contributing, why our nations are contributing to this distant uh, conflict. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the questions and answers, which should pick up on all of our points, I hope.